This is Peter Ross from London. Hello and welcome. My very special guest today is a man who started his career with Marty Wilde in the 60s. He has had the most phenomenal success worldwide. My very special guest today, talking about his brand new album, Spirits of the Western Sky, is Justin Hayward. Listen to our words and his music. Isn't it a strange world in the end? A big welcome to Justin Hayward. How are you, Justin? Very well, thanks. Good. We're very excited about the new album that you're releasing out. Uh, which is called Spirits of the Western Sky. How did you come up with that album uh, title? It really came from um, the fact that I got a bit of a, a, a thing about... Uh, I mean, I only live in a, in a flat now, and I have done in a few different flats or apartments over the last few years, mm. that, that faces the western sky. Mm. I feel comfortable and open when, when I can see the... Um, towards the sunset and and to have that feeling in the evening you know and i've never chosen a place it, it suddenly dawned on me nothing to do with satellite television or anything like that mm. it was it was the fact that it um I'm, I'm more comfortable doing that and it probably goes back to my childhood when, we, when i was small my brother and i um our parents were both teachers and they were out an awful lot and my brother and i were in the house and we we shared this room at the back of the house in in swindon in wiltshire that had the most amazing view of the western sky. There was just uh, actually school playing fields behind it, and then nothing, rolling hills of Wiltshire. And you could see the weather coming, and you, you could the sky was just vast. And I remember us both feeling that our heroes were out there in that western sky, from mm. Buddy to the Everleys and to Nat King Cole, even Johnny Ray when he was... <laughs> um, we love Johnny Ray mm, too, mm. and uh, and Bobby Darin, and it's fascinated me ever since. Do you think, as a boy growing up in Swindon, uh, looking out at that western sky, that you'd have achieved what you've achieved today? Looking back, did well, you have all I, those I dreams? Have thought about that. I'd have thought that you know that I'd have been thinking about my conkers or something, <laughs> <laughs> or playing the or, ukulele, or, or getting the ukulele. That's about it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, when did I mean, you... even in the Moody Blues, there's no, there's never been any kind of plan. We've stumbled from one sort of uh, happy accident to almost fatal accident, uh, one after another. Well, it was a happy accident that you uh, replied to the Melody Maker ad- advertisement. And how did that actually happen? Were you buying the Melody Maker every week when you, when you were reading it? Were you looking for for for, for something to to do in in professionally in 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 the business? I was definitely buying the Melody Maker every week or reading it in the music shops. No, I was. It was the uh, it was the, the the melody maker small ads in in the sixties were the place to to find work. And um, first of all, I was lucky enough. I had one huge slice of luck. Mm. I only a couple of months after I'd left school, when I had decided to turn professional, which meant staying in bed in the morning, really. <laughs> but the um, I answered an ad in the Melody Maker, and I got a job playing for Marty Wilde. Yeah. And I was his guitar player for about a year, 18 months. Right. And so I tried it again, and um, after I left Marty, or Marty really didn't need me anymore, really, he needed to go on and do his own things. And then, um, yes, I wrote to Eric Burden's... I knew someone in Eric Burden's office, so I pointed that out in the answer to the ad. <laughs> right. And uh, a couple of weeks later, I had a a phone call from Mike Pinder in the Moody's, completely out of the blue. So it was a wonderful slice of luck. And um, Ray Coleman, um, the late Ray Coleman from The Melody Maker, became one of my closest friends in later years. You know, you say things about uh, you were lucky and you are in the right place at the right time. Uh, do, Do you believe that it's all planned out before? Or do you think that, you know, how do you look at life now, five decades back, from the success that you had in the 60s, how do you do you think it's all all predestined? Well, I, let's let's put it this way: I must have answered several other ads yeah. that didn't um, didn't bear any fruit, and um, you know, I, I I was close to joining the Flower Pot Men. Oh right, so life could have been quite different. So I, I, the answer to that one, Peter, is I don't know. When you started off at 15 and 16, and and you were playing, was did you did you naturally pick up uh, writing music then, or or was it something that developed later? I, that really started <clears throat> with um, Marty Wilde, yeah. and Marty was very keen on doing his own things. He actually, uh, oddly, like me, in, uh, a few years later, 
had had a lousy publishing deal and had been signed up very young. Mm. And he would write often in someone else's name. In fact, I recorded with him with, him, with things that he'd written just using a different name, mm. a made-up name. But he really told me then that to survive in the business, you needed your own identity and your own sound. And, and uh, that, that was so true. And I started really writing then, and I really got into it. Uh, I, I really did, after Marty and before the Moody's, I think I saw myself as a songwriter. So I was really sending off demos and acetates that I'd made in the publisher's office um, all, all around the place trying to get some something going. What sort of no, adv- Nothing much happened. No. What sort of, adv- a bit like me really, uh, what sort of advice would you give to anybody just starting out today who's a prospective songwriter? What would you say to them that uh, would help them not make the mistakes probably that you made? You mean business mistakes? Mm. Being taken advantage of maybe? Yeah, well, get, get a lawyer and find out what the, the real industry standard is and protect your own copyrights at all costs yeah ne- never give away never sign away your copyrights did you ever take it up with Lonnie Donegan about that or did you ever have a chat with him about to see if, see if something could be done uh, L- Lonnie um, in my experience was a deeply unpleasant man mm. and so um, I'm sure there are quite a few uh, there were quite a few old blues singers sitting in the deep south of America wondering whether they should have that conversation about uh, you know Rock Island Lion or different songs that Lonnie um, puts traditional arrangements on tradition, traditional arrangement by Lonnie Donegan and released them and took all the royalties so I, I don't feel that bad about it you know So Raoul uh, Rincon how did, how did you get involved with him with this? Well it was the Swedish boys P.O. and their fixer Mutti yeah. who, who wrote to me originally with, with saying that they liked really um, I know you're out there somewhere and they were doing a sort of club version for it, but they couldn't extract what they wanted out of sample, out of the Moody Blues recording. Mm-hmm. And in fact, they only wanted the chorus lines and a bit of my old DX7 that I played on the record yeah. and some um, percussion stuff. Yeah. So Alberto and I like, really liked what they'd done and the, the other things they'd done were just great and they knew what they were doing and uh, so we said yes and and we did it and we collaborated with them and then Pio and Mutti really um, turned out this great great version and then I never thought much about it and except that Alberto and I most evenings when we finished recording would put that on and dance around the studio because it made us happy and you, you couldn't sit still to it and when it came time to compiling the album, I said to Alberto, you know, it'd be such a shame if, these, if the, 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 that, that lovely track would just go, what would happen to it? It'd just be a clubbing thing for a few people. Mm. And we both agreed, yeah, let, let's put it out. So we included it in the album. And then when we told um, Pio and Mutti, uh, they said, funny you should say that because there's another guy down in Ibiza that does this stuff. And he liked it too. And here's what he's done. So... Um, I thought, well, I'll include that too. A couple of people from the United States have asked me to ask you if you'll be promoting the album and uh, will you be touring with it? I, I hope so. I've certainly asked, been asked, and um, yes, it's a, it's, a, it's a definite maybe and a distinct, more than a definite maybe. Uh, Also, we've got another question here. This is from uh, Pamela in New York, and Pamela says, uh, can you tell us where this photograph's been taken of the front cover? Um, Not at this moment, I can't, no. No, that that will have to live in... um, That will have to live in the imagination for a moment. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's a real photograph, though. It wasn't... it's It's a real photograph that was taken by chance, actually. That's just by a photographer a friend, uh, who's a friend of mine. Oh, OK, OK. Yeah. Um, have you uh, spent... Unlike the photographs on the back that were taken by the same friend, but in, in um, you know, deliberately uh, yeah. constructed. Yeah. You, know, you often find that sometimes, you know, when you, t- when you have these photographs taken just, just on the chance, uh, they end up better than the ones that you actually pose for. Yes. Yes, that's right, yeah. Now, I know you've spent several years working on this CD... Uh, will there be any video to promote it as well? I think Eagle Rock have got a what they call a lyric video mm. in mind, for certainly for a couple of tracks from it, and that's all I know at the moment. It would be nice, wouldn't it? Oh, well, it would be a good idea. I mean, 
uh, you're obviously you're going on this uh, Moody's cruise uh, in mm-hmm. March. Um, well, actually, we're doing a whole tour before the cruise. As are well, you? Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. When do, when do you yeah. start? Where do you start? Uh, well, we start with some. Uh, we, uh, I actually start on March the third, right. and um, do, we're doing a couple of sort of promo things, and then I think the tour starts on March the seventh. And where's where, where where's the first date? In um, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Oh, lovely! I wish you really well with that. Can oh, I, thank you. Can I go back to the early days? So, so you joined the Moody Blues uh, just slightly after was 1967 or 1966? Yeah, uh, uh, no, I joined in 66. August 66. 66. Yeah. And were you were you influenced by anybody around at that particular time? Oh, totally. I think I, I think I remember putting in my um, uh, sort of when I wrote to Eric Burden all sorts of stuff about groups that I like, which I've totally forgotten now. Mm. But, uh, yes, I think, um, you know, the, it, you'd have to say that the, that the Beatles were our leaders and, in London. For those of us who were lucky enough to be in London in the mid-60s and mm. living there, mm. that um, they were the number one, and they were our leaders and that everyone followed. So I would have to say that they were the, the people that I looked up to most. And um, apart from that, it was... Uh, Simon, Paul Simon and Garfunkel mm. and, um, uh, and Buffalo Springfield have just uh, brought that great album out, yeah. Nights in white satin We're talking to Justin Hayward. I don't know whether you know, but Esther Ranson. Do you remember Esther Ranson? Of course. Her favourite song is Nights in White Satin. Oh, I did not know that. Yep, and uh, she did a bit with me a while ago, and uh, she really, we said, oh, well, we'll play this song as well, and she put the, the headphones on, and you couldn't get them off her until the whole song was finished. Oh. She really, really loved it, yeah. Well, if you're in touch with her, please thank her for me. That's, um, that's, that's very touching, yes. When you recorded Nights in White Satin, that was for a demo record for Decca, wasn't it? Yes, it was a demonstration stereo record. Yes. Now you see, we don't get those these days. Can you explain exactly what that was? What was it? Why why it was made like that? Because they, Decca had a, a very large consumer division that was selling record players. Right. And they wanted to demonstrate that stereo could be as interesting for rock and roll as it was for classical music. Mm-hmm. At, the, at that time, their record players, their stereo systems, were confined to classical fans, and they wanted to move that out of that area they were there, and they were selling bucket loads of pop records Decca, mm. but they were all in mono and they wanted to move the album into a, into the the rock album into a stereo format and um really uh, fortunately coinciding with fm radio just starting in america so um that we had a debt to them we were kind of like their house band right and so um so we did it did you find that uh, when knights in white satin had that success that your life changed completely you know i didn't because it was a very long slow success uh, it Nights got to the top of the charts in America in 1972 or 73. Mm-hmm. Now it was released in 1967. Yeah. So it, I had plenty of time to get used to it. <laughs> I think the biggest shock was in France because it went straight to number one there. Right, right. And, um, and that, that was wonderful. But still, it was, um, it, it was sort of an insider thing. It was a little bit, uh, I wouldn't use the word underground, but if there was a word like it, it would be, I would use it. Who, who are you influenced by today, Justin? Do you know, I'm, I'm, I've come full circle to my uh, teenage years. And now, because of iTunes, I find myself buying singles all over the place. Yeah. So, um, what was the last single you bought? What was the last single I bought? Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm going to tell you. Mm-hmm. Because I'm just going to look it up and, and see. Um, the last single I bought was... Um, well, the last record I bought was Colby Kalat. Right. And with a song called Oxygen, which I really loved. Oh, right, okay. oh no, it wasn't. I've had one since that. It's called, it's, from, it's called Would That Not Be Nice? And who's that? By there? Divine Fitz which is a superb record. Rush out and download it. You go back to your early days and you say that you were a big fan of Johnny Ray Elvis, Buddy Holly. Uh, Roy Orbison, perhaps, or, or not so much? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and, I've, I've, do you know, I became more aware of Roy, really, uh, at in the UK just a bit later on. Mm-hmm. I think he, he wasn't that visible at that time. I think Roy's time was to come, you know, in, in, later in the 60s and more, not, not so much in the 50s. Out of all of the songs that you've written, and I mean, you've written so many songs, out of all the songs that you've written, what is your absolute favourite? Do I, I, you know my absolute favourite is I Know You're Out There Somewhere. Oh, really? Mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah, cool. 
because it's a wonderful song to play on on stage. When you're performing on stage, is that the pinnacle of what you do, or or, or do you prefer to sit down and write songs? Um, it, there's such a different medium. There, there's there's such a different approach to uh, to, to presenting music, and um, I, I, I more and more I've come to appreciate the stage performance and the instant feeling in a room. I, I, I'm always and uh, there's a magic created in a room full of people and no matter how many or how small and uh, that is a wonderful thing to be able to share in and that's a kind of drug in itself the, the rubbish dressing rooms are something else every day but but that feeling is something that is very very precious so it's it's very different i don't prefer it uh, in any way because the two the two things songwriting and and stage work are completely different but um stage work can become a drug tell me something do you do you ever get tired of playing your guitar no, no, I don't, because the, the, the guitars are a work of art in their own right. They're things of beauty. Mm. And uh, I, so, sometimes when you come back to it, you haven't played for a couple of months or something, you know, it, it's hard to get going again because, on your fingers. But no, life without a guitar, or, or without being able to look at a guitar, quite, I'm looking at one now, right. you know, it is, would be quite disturbing. with all the same guitars or do you have a separate a separate set uh, that you tour with and a separate set that you have at home that's no, the latter i do have a separate set that i have at home but they 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 um they, they cross over some of my road guitars obviously are in the studio i have one guitar since I, i've had since 1967 mm. uh, a gibson 335 that really plays me and um that i could never be without and is, is that guitar that you played on the uh, days of the future past no I, I didn't have it on days of future past I, I i was playing an acoustic guitar then actually um i had an acoustic guitar and a telecaster because it was cheap with the telecaster was cheap the acoustic guitar i renovated actually for lonnie donegan oh, and um after i'd renovated he, he gave it to me it was right. just deteriorating he gave it to me and i renovated it and, and it played on nights and all that kind of stuff uh, and then uh, then he took it back a couple of years later nice. but i've got it back again oh, right. enough his, 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 his wife sold it to me uh, only a few years ago that was very charitable wasn't it yeah it's very charitable i noticed i noticed that uh, you were in the fab 208 magazine quite a bit and you always seem to have a, a, a look on your face like staring into the distance do you remember doing any of those shots um i uh, i do remember I do remember some of those things. Yeah, some of those things were really quite fun. And the thing was that they were always good quality pictures. And that magazine, a Fab 208, was, was quite kind to the Moody's. And um, it was very nice, yes. And we all looked quite pretty in those days, too. Well, then, that's, that's another trademark that you've got. You've always got that your, your long blonde hair. <laughs> Some of it, yes. Well, some, most of it. somebody somebody asked me to ask you what products what products do you use on it? <laughs> oh, oh, Peter, Peter, um, whatever's in the hotel bathroom. <laughs> so you, I mean, because it because it really is your trademark, isn't it? Is it? Yeah, I think so. Well, that's rather disturbing. No, 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 because women absolutely love your blonde hair. That, that's quite disturbing. <laughs> I, I can't change my mind. It is disturbing. <laughs> I want to bring your attention to, you were once described as being the college band of the US. Uh, how did that help you, you know, conquer the United States of America? Well, I think that was right. I mean, we were one of the very few bands, uh, it was another group called 10 Years After, that were that were on Decca actually with us, but... Um, that were prepared to go to America and be well down the bill mm. and touring in support of other people. So many groups that had success in the UK in those mid-60s that went to America, expected to be top of the bill. When they didn't get immediate success, they said, oh, America's no good, and went, came back. And you... We were brought to America by Bill Graham in right. 1968, mm. and um, then we just supported everybody, turned up at all sorts of gigs, were, were on these things with six or seven people on the bill on these stadiums and just kept working and most of that work you know at least half of that work was in colleges and students 
you know, organ, student organizers that would book a lot of people. Mm. Because groups like us really weren't expensive in those days. And, um, so I, I think that we were expressing the, the thoughts and sharing the thoughts of a lot of American students at that time. mentioned earlier on about um, answering the advertisement in the Melody Maker. How did you get together with uh, Jeff Wayne and uh, War of the Worlds? Um, Jeff re really did call me. Whether I was the first choice for that, I don't know. I've never asked him, actually. But he called me and said, I've got a, a song for you that would be really good for your voice. I think he, first of all, he said, are you the guy who sang Nights in White Satin? Because he's from Brooklyn or something. Right, right. And, um, and I said, well, I might be. So he said, got this song for you that um, I think would be great for your voice and I've done it in your key and that kind of stuff. So um, but he, I, he, he sent me around a, a demo of the song and um, actually a guy who worked for us in the Threshold office was in my house at the time mm. and he said, that's a great song, you really ought to do that. And I said, but I never, I don't do other people's material. And he said, well, maybe you should make an exception. He said, that really would be good for you. Wow. And so I, uh, I, I did it and then went on to take more part in the album and I did another track on the album called The Eve of the War, I think it's called. Yes. yes. Yeah, and uh, so that was that. And when they, um, I never th heard heard much more about it until about a year later, when the, the um, CBS promo guy called me and said, "You know that thing you did for Ever Autumn? He said it's in the charts." So uh, I said, "Well, let me know when it gets into the top 30, and uh, I'll come and help you promote it." And let's the go. Next week he called me. It's in the top 30, just <laughs> It's like, "Will you do top of the pops?" The summer sun is fading as the years. Do you still get excited when you release an album? I mean, you've released so many different albums. Do you still get excited when you release an album uh, with, with, with the expectation of what might happen? Yes. Um, of course, I've got the expectations of what might not happen yeah. as well. But, yeah. um, well, listen... I don't, that... I don't take it that that seriously and uh, a little bit world weary about that kind of stuff on this particular album do you have a particular do you have a favorite my favorite is a track that uh, is called one day sunday that was the last thing i did for the album and i recorded it with ann dudley and the orchestra i'd done the basic track and i knew she was so busy i, I you know she's a friend yeah and i knew she was so busy and i and i wrote to her and said do you think you might be interested in doing a couple of my songs mm. and because i think she was just starting on this lame is oh business. well yeah she was, she was the, piano, the girl who she? was actually she, she should get more she should get an oscar yeah because she was the girl who was playing while all these thespians sang sang live you know and took all the credit for yeah. singing live yeah. but she she did that and um and so I think she'd started that, so uh, I was hugely surprised when she wrote straight back and said, yeah, it'd be great. And of course, we had a wonderful time doing a couple of songs, So, um, but One Day Sunday is my favourite. Are you releasing singles from this album, which I like, incidentally? Thank you. Um, I d the answer is I don't know, because what they do now is they call them radio edits. Right. So I assume that if there will be a first single, it will be In Your Blue Eyes. In fact, the whole album, I think, is, is very strong. Um, you said that you left out a, a fair bit of uh, material that uh, you thought was maybe not, not appropriate for this particular album. So, so there is a chance that you'll be doing another album very sh shortly, or, or you're going to be just doing, doing those songs when you tour? Uh, no, I, I think I'll... I don't know what will happen. I've got a few unfinished things that were heading off in that social comment kind of direction right and so i just I, I just didn't finish them i think in truth um what appeals most to eagle rock the label is the things that i did in nashville because the bluegrass community in nashville just a few years ago welcomed me with open arms i suppose it's guitars get guys who can really play looking for a songwriter which i was so uh that's, that's another interesting direction, and I'm really tempted to um, do some more in that line. But we'll see. What, what, I've got to stumble past this lot first. Are you, are you drawn to going to the United States to perform and to write? Um, not so much to write. I prefer to be in, in, my little, um, in my little room in the dark, you know, very quietly and tucked away in a corner of the world to write. But um, 
America, yes, the land of my heroes. And uh, 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 yeah, it was uh, every time I go, it's sort of magic to me. With these places and the places that we play, and we were hugely fortunate to have that success there in the 1960s because it's been forever. Mm. And we could, uh, and me, all the Moody's could work there almost every day of the year. We're offered more work in the US now than we ever were when we were younger. It's amazing. All the, all the questions that we've got that have come into via the website have come in from America. Mm-hmm, couple in, cu- couple in from Holland, uh, but mostly, mostly these questions have come in from the United States. So that proves, mm. uh, obviously, proves that you're, you're very, very popular there. I wanted to ask you about the first hit that you had, uh, which was "Fly Me High." Mm-hmm. Um, when you write a song, do you do the music first? Do you come up with the lyrics? How do you, how do you go about it? Usually it comes out of a guitar uh, or, a, or a piano or a keyboard. And the, um, I think it, it was, it was it sounds awful, but you, you, it, it is true. Picasso said, you know, inspiration has to find you working. So it's no good waiting to while you're sitting on a train or walking down the street or in a restaurant expecting some inspiration to hit you and you write it down and you and you make a song of it. it you have it's you have to sit there with the guitar dedicate the time to it and that's that's the way it's done for me songs usually come out of the a, a, the guitar it usually gives me a great gift Are you disciplined with the way that you write? Well, I'm not very disciplined. It's it's a series of random uh, bits and playing just for fun, and then that little bit of inspiration, that little bit of light happens. That little, uh, you know, lightning bolt happens. Yeah. But that's about that's only about three percent of the song. Then it's ninety percent, ninety-seven percent work. Yes. To finish it, to finish it, to to keep it to the same standard that that little bit of inspiration was at. Are you are you very critical with the songs that you write that uh, you maybe just put on to the side, you don't use them? Are you very, very critical with yourself? It's a question of, um, it's easy to finish a song badly, and I've done that many times, and I'm still guilty of it, just just to sort of go, oh, and put my pencil down. <laughs> but um, what I want re- most is to have a whole series of pieces of inspiration that come into one song, mm. and uh, that, that can be put together with that kind of ambience and that kind of mood. Are there, are there any aspirations that you have in the music business that you haven't achieved yet? I don't think so. In, in, it, I don't think so. I mean, the, the awards, things, that, that, that I don't aspire to any of those or Hall of Fame or anything. I mean, I, I read a, a lovely quote um, by Billy Wilder and, and he said, uh, what did he say? He said, um, a, oh, awards yes. are like hem- hemorrhoids. <laughs> so sooner or later, every arsehole gets one. So, <laughs> I'm with him on that stuff. <laughs> but, um, no, I, I, you know, I don't know. Because, you know. like I said earlier, I'll stumble on things and meet people and fall in love with people and then off I go again. You know what, Justin? That, that remark's going to come back to haunt you when you're going up getting a, a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame award. <laughs> Isn't it? Yes. Yes. It's a t- yes. Well, it's- it's probably true. Yeah. Justin Hayward, I've, I've really enjoyed talking to you today. Thank you very much indeed for coming on the show. I wish you all the very best with this wonderful album, Spirits of the Western Sky, and uh, we'll sign out with a nice track. Thank you, Justin. Oh, thank you, Peter. You're very kind. And please, hello to all of your, your, your listeners, and uh, hi, everybody. Get round to seeing you all soon. Justin, fantastic. Thank you very much. Cheers, Peter. Bye.